Hello, my name is Ariel Detweiler. I am a freelance bassoonist, teacher, and owner of ACDC Reads in the Twin Cities, and I am here to help you do a great audition for Gitsies for the Philharmonic and Symphony excerpts. First, if you've never taken an audition before, it's important to follow the guidelines that Gitsies gives you for your audition. Since we're all doing video submissions right now, it's important to really be professional about the order that you do your uh, audition in. For example, if they tell you to play scales first, then excerpts, then your solo, do it in that order. Just to make sure that they have a really great trajectory of what you're going to do and then how you're going to do it. So, in this video, I'm going to show you, with my dog Zeus here, <laughs> how to play these excerpts effectively. You have two Tchaikovsky excerpts, both in Symphony No. 4. They are both very, very well known, so I'm going to help you through them a little bit. So, it's important to realize that these excerpts aren't necessarily divided into lyrical and technical. I think they actually have a little bit of both. And they actually have a lot of really great musical gestures that you can do to add something to the music that isn't, isn't written on the page. It is written a little bit, but not as much as you might think. If you listen to the recordings of these, you can listen to many different recordings. And a great resource is the orchestralbassoon.com. It's a really great resource for you to go to and make sure that you're listening to like five different recordings of different bassoonists and different orchestras playing these excerpts so that you get some differ differing opinions on how you can play it. So first thing is to make sure that you're really listening to the style of the group. For the first excerpt in movement one, it starts with the clarinet and then you echo the clarinet and then you go back and forth, and then you have a big little, a little cadenza for a measure, and then you've got just chords held for a very, very, very long time. It's really important to hold the chords as long as they're written because you're actually playing over string chords that are in tempo. So if you're thinking about the menomoso in the first excerpt as, oh, it's just long notes, you're wrong. Listen to the recording and you'll hear that the strings have a varied tempo, very slow, but they're playing chords underneath you. So you have to make sure that you play the entire time. Now, obviously in an audition, you don't have strings below you to really show you where the tempo is. So that's where you have to think of it internally and make sure you're keeping that tempo steady in your head the whole time. Now the tempo in both of these excerpts changes just slightly. So in the first excerpt, we're going to go from a regular vol a valse tempo, a waltz, to slow, a little bit slower, a little bit slower, and then lingering. <laughs> So, the key here is to listen to what's happening behind you. Notice that the accents always come on an offbeat. That's because the strings are playing on every other beat that's not emphasized. On the ritardando section, you have two measures that are with the strings, opposite of the strings. So they have one three and you have two, right? But On the third measure of the ritardando, starting on that high G, that's your cadenza. Now, that doesn't mean that you get to take it completely out of tempo, but that means that the ritardando isn't as extreme as you think until you get to that cadenza section. So that third measure is the most important for slowing down. <laughs> Now, 
obviously this is a long excerpt and it's not fast. It's moderato, right? So moving forward, but also keeping it steady. The question is where to breathe, right? Because the menomoso slows down the tempo so much, it's really hard to take a breath. Since your cadenza leads into the B flat at the menomoso, you don't want to take a breath between the D flat and the B flat. So I would recommend taking a breath before the B natural. Very quick breath, big breath, just to make sure that you get enough breath to last until the end of the measure. Now, since this, this is already mezzo forte and it's de decrescendoing and you've got a diminuendo on the C to the end, you're not going to need as much breath as you think you do. So, if we're playing that whole lyrical line from 106 to the end. Oh, I ran out of breath. So I have to take it before the B natural. For the diminuendo, you don't have to get too soft, but try not to pinch to bring that down. Try to put a little bit more pressure on the top of the reed to bring that down by moving your head just slightly down. That sometimes helps create the pressure that you need to make the decrescendo rather than pinching from all sides and making the pitch right up. So, also for the accents, in order to make the accents really pop the way they should, lyrically and with the accent, making sure that you're cutting off the note before the accent just a little bit with a rounded release to make sure that you get those accents to sound like accents. If you play them too long, it can sound a little too lyrical and dragged. <laughs> lost a little bit, right? But if we create a little bit of space before that accent, good? All right. Let's talk about the solo in movement two. This one looks very simple with five flats. This is the last solo iteration in the second movement. You, as the bassoonist, get the last say. If you listen to the very beginning of the movement, the oboe has the first solo appearance of this solo exactly. But some recordings take a lot of liberties with the tempo because the oboe is only accompanied by a couple pizzicatos in the strings every once in a while. So the oboist has so much room to be lyrical and change the tempo and emphasize certain notes. And you'll hear the tempo change a lot in the oboe solo. With the bassoon solo, it's not the case. Why? Because there's a different accompaniment going on. Realizing what you're playing with is really important when you're playing excerpts. You should be able to hear what's going on around you to know where you can push, where you can pull, and where you have to stay in tempo. For example, this excerpt is long, doesn't look like there's many breaks for breaths, right? And it's sl slow, and it's all in tenor clef, and it's very high, it's very taxing. But if you know where to breathe, you'll be golden. Planning out your breath in this one is really, really important. I would recommend breathing after the a natural into 80 because that part leads to the next espressivo section. So there's two distinct sections in this one plus the little coda on the end. Now 
It's all eighth notes in this one, but they're written differently with slurs specifically in specific areas. Some of the slurs end in staccatos and others don't. When they end in staccatos, that doesn't necessarily mean shortening the note to the point where you cut it off. Shorten the note with a rounded release, but make sure that that note sounds because every single note in this excerpt is important. A few tricks to make sure that that happens correctly. At the beginning, it's marked pianissimo. The strings have some chords beneath you and some pizzicatos. Making sure that you're soft but still soloistic is really important. So you should still have a good, rounded, warm tone, but it's subdued, right? You're only playing with strings here. So really making sure that you're just above them but not so much that you're overpowering. The other thing is, because it's all eighth notes, emphasizing certain eighth notes that sound more important to the melody can actually make this so much more interesting. For example, at 280, we're descending and we have some, some jumps rather than just, just scalar motion, right? So instead of playing it straight, <laughs> And in tempo, I'm going to emphasize one and two to emphasize those notes are more important. And come away to the A natural. Now, the other thing about this measure is that when you take that breath, you always have time to take that breath. As long as you basically stay in tempo, don't take a huge breath like if we do that's way too much, right? But if we take a short breath, just so that we have enough to make it to the end of the phrase. Okay? Now, a really good exercise to understanding the phrasing of the second half of the section here is to really play with only the descending lines. So try starting on the top note of every iteration of this melody, since it happens three times. We've got an F, we've got an E flat, and we've got a D flat. So try it, try playing just those descending lines. should be the loudest. It says espressivo, which means you can take some liberties here with the, with the dynamics, with your emphasis of certain notes, and how each one relates to each other. In my opinion, I think the first one is less important than the second. So the E flat, I think, is the most important one to push towards. And then the D flat comes away a little bit as it descends back down. That last eighth note is not short. Make sure you play it with a good amount of flesh on it 
to make sure that that last B flat ends the phrase that you've just played so beautifully. Also, notice that when we talked about those three descending lines, the F, the E flat, and the D flat, the last one doesn't have an accent. Did you notice that? If it doesn't have an accent, it's less important than the first two. So the F on top has an accent. The E flat on top has an accent. And then the D flat doesn't. So come away just a little bit on that last D flat. Also, espressivo can mean that you use vibrato, like a lot. <laughs> vibrato doesn't always mean that you should play it all the time, though. On bassoon, we have the luxury where we get to choose when to use vibrato and when it's most effective. In this case, I would say choosing the most effective notes to use vibrato on, like those top notes, the, that top F, that top E flat, the top D flat, and then maybe the last B flat. Those are the most important notes to use vibrato on. In the middle of all those notes, you can choose which notes you want to emphasize with vibrato. You don't have to constantly use it. If we were constantly using vibrato, it get a little overkill, right? So choose when to use vibrato. Morendo means. Do you know what it means? It means dying away. So in this case, the strings, what are they doing? Pizzicatos. So for the very last beat, if you cut off with the strings, it'll be with their pizzicato. So really listen to that recording for when exactly you cut off, because it's not just a dying away and it's just you. You're with the strings. So really understanding that that has to be in tempo from where you started. The biggest problem with the end of this excerpt is when you start on that lower octave D flat, you've been playing in the higher octave the entire time on that high D flat, right? Now we jump down an octave. Do you know what happens before the bassoon comes in at the very end? The clarinet plays the exact same thing. So making sure that you're matching the clarinet's tone when you're coming into this solo. Also, since you're playing in an audition, you don't need to play the entire nine measures rest. Whenever you have a long rest that you need to cut down for an audition, try and do it in a logical way that will make sense to a different ear. For example, when you end on the B flat on beat one, play out that measure in your head with the rests, then count one more measure, and then maybe another measure, depending on how much breath time you need because you will be out of breath. Two measures of rest after the B flat measure, and then come in on the solo. Now, during those two measures of rests, you really should be thinking about how relaxed you feel. Because if you come in on that D flat, that lower D flat too soon, when you're out of breath and you're tired and you're tense and you're nervous, it's gonna be way sharp. So really thinking about centering your air to a low O. Now try the beginning again to make sure it's in tune. Really make sure those three notes match up. Now, a trick to the very last note you've been waiting for. A trick is put your first finger, when you start playing the F, put your first finger way below the first hole so that none of it is covered. And then, gradually, as you, as you play the F and you need to die away, very, on the very last bit, cover that first hole just slightly with your finger. Not so much that it'll change the pitch, but so that you actually get some of that air to be covered up, so it creates kind of a dying away effect. It'll help. <laughs> Good luck on your audition. I hope this was helpful. Thanks for watching.